Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. I'm grateful to be alive and sober, part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we're in the far turn, we've got just a few weeks to go doing this, and uh, we get to talk about uh, 10, 11, and 12 over the next few weeks. <clears throat> My experience with that uh, discipline, um, strict disciplines for many of us who do 10, 11, and 12. Not talk about 10, 11, and 12, but actually do it and experientially can talk about it. Um, one of the things I've found uh, with 10 and 11, it's one of the, the first steps that drop off the map for many of us when we're on this path or claim to be on this path. So um, we'll kick it around and see where God takes us. Uh, God separated me from alcohol on June 23rd, 1988. And uh, that power separated me and kept me separated till tonight. And as long as I suit up and show up to the altar and, and do all the things that I'm expected to do, um, <clears throat> to much is given, much is expected, um, I continue to stay sober. One of the neat things <clears throat> I've gotten to experience, um, coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, experiencing grace, which keeps me sober. And if I look back on my life while I was out there, a lot of the near misses of dead and alive, it was grace that kept me sober. Uh, being in the streets and a lot of bad things happening to me, getting involved in a lot of illegal things, it was grace that kept me from going to prison. It was grace that kept me from having a bullet in me. It was grace that kept me you know, out of trouble, out of scrapes. And I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and based on my track record, I should have been drunk many times in Alcoholics Anonymous in the early days. Uh, but somehow I, remained to, I was able to remain away from a drink. I get into this big book with a sponsor who I'm accountable to, and a group of folks who I've been accountable to since I got here, and that group of folks has changed and evolved, uh, but I get to experience the power, which gives me grace. And I have found a huge difference in getting grace, which is kind of like this gift from God just to being one of his children, which we would do if any of us have children. Even though we're angry with them, we want to punish them and do all the things that we, we do to bring them upright, they're still our children, and we'll go hungry and give them our food and go cold and give them our clothes because they're ours. That's just grace. That's what God has done for me in, in the near misses and keeping me sober. Uh, but somehow I'm able to experience that power which breathes life into me and keeps me in a position of neutrality, safe and protected and unharmed. And the least I can do is suit up and show up to the altar my altar, and give him thanks. And continue to ask him to uh, let me carry the vision of his will into all my activities, not my will into the activities that are convenient for me. And what I found is this path, uh, this spiritual path, um, is not as easy as many of us might think, or I thought it was on the outset. The spiritual path is a very narrow road. And the things I could have gotten away with in my first six months, and I did, I can no longer get away with now. That doesn't mean the mind is not going to pull me in the direction it wants to pull me, and ego wants to separate me from that power. Ego wants to separate me from you. Ego wants to separate, separate from the big book, etc. So the mind's always working. But discipline to the spiritual life, being disciplined to the spiritual life, only comes from God, and it starts with my willingness to do anything, the gift of desperation. huh? But it can be a really lonely walk at times on a spiritual path. And only if you're on that kind of walk do you know what I'm talking about. It goes beyond the camaraderie of the fellowship, the sacred fellowship, and the handshakes and the hugs, which all are band-aid on an open moon when we get in. We need that. We still, I still look forward to that, being around our kind of folks. But there's something else that goes on, and um, the road gets really narrow, and the door we're going to walk through is even more narrow. And that separates, in a sense, me from many others, or others from other folks in the masses. And sometimes you will be revered or reviled. I have been because of this book and the walk we walk. Sometimes in the same meeting and sometimes by the same person. First half of the meeting they like you, second half of the meeting they hate you. Especially when we speak truth or you touch a nerve in someone or you wake someone up to the fact that maybe they could be doing more and they're not. But that's just the price to pay for the glory of God in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And when we study any kind of history of spiritual people, we will see how they were put to the test many times and even doubted their faith, doubted their existence, doubted the walk. But somehow we continue to chop wood and carry wood and find ourselves just doing what we do. And the great thing about being on a spiritual walk is that you can't do anything else but that. You can't see yourself doing anything else but that. The walk I walk is my walk. I'm a spoke in a very big wheel here in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's no better, no worse. No more spiritual, less spiritual than anyone else. But uh, I couldn't fathom living any other life. I couldn't imagine going through recovery without having a sponsor that I speak to regularly, consistently, and accountable to, and responsible to weekly. At least weekly. <clears throat> Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock, I lock myself in my bedroom with my big book and a notepad and a pen, and I go to my sponsor, my teacher. And whatever he's got, I do. And many things he tells me to do, I'm not always too thrilled about. Sometimes amends, sometimes assignments, sometimes reworking his stuff, sometimes taking a look at stuff that I don't really want to look at. I couldn't imagine life without having that. It isn't dependence upon another human being, but it is a connection and a needed one to keep me accountable. I have found most folks who uh, uh, aren't accountable, me in my first six months, usually we go sideways. I went sideways, and we get sick quick, and the ego is so in charge, they never tell me that people are going sideways. So I need someone who can see what I can, that sponsorship. So how could I walk 10 and 11 without being accountable to someone? How could I walk 10 and 11 without really having a prayer life and a life of meditation? And the neat thing is I don't need to tell anyone about it other than when I'm invited to go talk and speak truth. I don't need to run around and say, you know how much I pray? You know, let me tell you how humble I am. Give me about an hour. You know, I'm such a super neat guy. Let me tell you. I don't need to do any of that stuff. And anyone on a spiritual path doesn't need to do that unless you ask or you're invited to a podium to go share what it was like, what happened, what it's like now, what we're trying to be like now. We go forward through the steps, admit, accept, and surrender in step one. Take a real good look at a problem. And for me, my step one was really done out there. One of my teachers called it step zero. You know, the research we do, we come back in here with a lot of arrows in our butt and say, okay, what do I do now? And sometimes it takes a lot of bottoming out. And then we come in here and we get an education and more important than that, the transformation happens as to what's wrong with me and what I need to do. And only through desperation do I say, okay, give me more. Lock into that, okay, what's next? What's next? Even though I don't know where I'm going, still don't. Still don't know where I'm going. My life is still none of my business. And I take a look at step one about the phenomena called craving, the, the mental obsession, and this thing called the spiritual malady, which I really didn't know was when I got here. I thought it was religion. And at some point, religion and spirituality just might meet, depending on how our journey looks and what we're searching for. But at the beginning, I had to get clear. It's two different walks. And for me, I had a lot of problems with religion, but I couldn't have an argument with spirituality because they says all you need to do is believe in something other than you, something greater than you, this power of all love and no opposite, and, the, uh, and bringing that into all your affairs. What an order, I can't go through it, with, but it had to be better than what I was doing, even sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. It had to be better because you can sober me up, but I can still be a horse thief. I'm just a sober horse thief. I can be more dangerous sober. I was very predictable when I was drunk. I usually pass out and do stupid things. Embarrass you, embarrass myself, and then get arrested. Okay. Step two is my point that this power that was greater than me was going to restore me to wholeness of mind, to truth, to sanity, where the drink problem, the thought about drinking, was going to be removed. And I want to get there. Of course, it has to be better than what I'm doing. A group of drunks would go the only direction. I found safety and power in these numbers. And I felt some sort of uh, uh, consoling when I would walk into them, some sort of band-aid on an open wound, being around our kind. You know, the hugs and the handshakes and the camaraderie, that was something good. Because out there, as we know, it's not like that. You pay to get stuff, and that's it. You don't have a friendly drug dealer. You might think he's your friend. But until you come up short one day, then they don't know you. And then you beg, borrow, steal, get on your knees, plead, beg, and do a lot of funky things to get that stuff. And the bartender might give you a buyback once in a while, but if you have no money, the bouncers throw you out. And the liquor store will give you credit once in a while, but you got to pay your tab, otherwise you don't get served. So it goes on and on and on. I come in here, and they're like, just glad to see me because you're one of us. I've said this a million times. This is the only place on the planet that I know 
that I can tell you guys about the most god-awful things I've done in my life, and you say, give me a number, I'll give you a call. <laughs> now you tell a civilian that, you go to a PTA meeting and say, here's what I did, you're not invited back. They call the cops. Right? You go up to your neighbor and say, you know how many times I beg hard and stole and ripped people off? I even held guns to people. Can I come over for Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> we say, yeah, come on over, bring your friends too, right? <clears throat> Oh, me too. <laughs> step three was the decision. A lot of times in some of our AA meetings, bless their hearts, step three, they tell you just hang around step three. Work step three. Get a good third step. We're either 12 and 12 for the next six months. Usually we die. So we gather up information about this step three. We talk about step three till the cows come home, about what it is, my will, God's will, turning it over, letting go, all this stuff. We don't have a clue what that means. And if we want to find out what that means, what we do is make a decision in three by way of third step prayer with the sponsor and launch into a course of vigorous action, step four. That's how we do step three, by doing four through nine. That's it. Because as an alcoholic, when I say I turn my will and life over to care of God, great. Now what? In 20 minutes, I'm acting out again. I'm in fear again. I'm taking over. I'm controlling. I'm vengeful. All these things. The defects are still, still breathing. Step three is simply a decision. So about three, four months ago, I, Mary and I decided to go on this diet because I was sick and tired of having this stuff here. And I didn't like the idea. I'm not a gym guy. I don't like going to the gym and working out and walking around like I've been working out for eight years. You know those guys in the gym, right? You get the bottle water guys. They work out one time. They got a vat of water, 25 headbands plugged into God. I, I can't do that. So we made a decision to go on a diet, a really healthy diet. And what we did was we took some action, which meant I couldn't eat ice cream at night. And I couldn't have cake. And I couldn't have pasta. And then we talked about it. We get to not eat that. We get to not do that because we get to live healthy. So it was in the action. A week went by, a month went by, two months went by, three months went by. And suddenly things started to change. Feel healthier, etc. By taking action. You go to the gym on day one. Six months later, you look like you've been taking care of your body. People say, what's going on? You look great. Hmm? You look different. You look healthy. Okay. Step three was simply a decision to go to this power. Yeah, I'm going to turn everything over to this power, but I haven't done a thing yet. I need to take some action, which means a sponsor is going to give me some instructions out of my book on how to begin to take action to make a difference in my consciousness, in my spirit, to wake it up. And that's by the removal of everything I think I am. Everything I think God is, isn't. Everything I think I am, isn't. And I find out what God is by finding out what God is not. Who I be by finding out what I am not. It goes on and on and on. The process of recovery is always removal, subtraction, never addition. I don't, we don't need a thing. Now the mind says, oh, I need things. I need a cell phone. That's the first thing I need in order to recover. I work in the treatment center business. I never saw attachments to a cell phone in my life. Lie, cheat, and steal to get possession of a cell phone so I can be spiritual. Got to go on Facebook first. And before I pray, let me hit Facebook to make sure I am liked today. Right? And we do all these things. So I start moving through four. And then I discuss in five. And then I take a look at what's left of the rubble in six and seven. The defects of character that are still breathing. And as long as they're around, I'm not going to truly experience this power called God. The interesting thing in the, 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 the flying the ointment here is I can't work on defects of character. We think we can. I'm working on my defects. How's that going for you? We can, what, how can I possibly work on a defect? In chapter two, Agnostics, it tells me lack of power is my dilemma. So what power do I have to work on a defect that's more powerful than me? In fact, I will protect the defects. I will own them. And the thought of losing certain defects is frightening. So I'll just mask it for a while and raise my hands. I'm working on my defects and try self-will to overcome self-will. It usually fails, sure. And then I'm back again. And then I'm kind of like cheating with ice cream and pasta, wondering how come I'm gaining weight again? Because I'm not committed to this. And it's a commitment. It's responsibility. But God can and God could have would if he was sought doesn't mean defects are going to go away in my time, in my way. In fact, some of those defects are simply assets taken to the extreme, becoming liabilities. And God has to remove some and tweak some. None of my business. 
but I need to go to God. I can't work on defects. Some of my meetings, we talk about six or seven. I'm working on this defect. No, you're not. You're doing nothing. You can't, we can't don't have the power to pull it off. But seeking the power, he'll do or she'll do what it will do what it has to do. And that's none of my affair. My job is to suit up and show up to the altar, to this book, and surrender in that brokenness to God. Because that's a real, real clear-cut, very tangible piece of information, 6 and 7. 6 and 7 says, Peter Marinelli, you are broken. You are not perfect. You have defects. You have cracks in the armor. And the only one who can seal those up is God. And so that's what I do. I don't know if I fully grasped all of that the first time through the work, but after a while you do. And you realize how damaging they are. And so we take a look at eight, and we go out and make amends, and things have changed dramatically by the time we're into amends. They ought to be. And by the time we're cleaning up all the amends, we're consciously aware of, I know for me, it was like the doors blew open on my life. I looked at everything different, felt things different. Who I was was completely different. And people were noticing it way before I did. I remember waking up one day and realizing, oh my God, things have changed me. I had another last time I thought about drinking. I'm taking care of myself, I'm showing up for work, I'm self-supporting to my own contributions, and I'm in love with God again. How did this happen? And I like the effect produced by recovery. And then as we're cleaning up nine, we slide into 10 and 11, and some of us start off like gangbusters and we're in that, and then the ego starts to reemerge because things are going so well. Bill says the goose hung high. Things were going so good for a while. I even have a couple of little sponsees I'm working with, and I'm a little bit of a big deal in my home group. And I start to read my own headlines. People say I'm doing good, and I depend on that. You say I'm doing good, I depend on that. And my talks depend on, oh, if I sound good, so they like me, because now I like the effect produced by that. I start to worship my emotions and my feelings rather than God. I need stuff to make me feel good. And what I've done, I just cut God out, the one power that's been feeding me. And the ego starts to flex its muscles a little bit and starts to stretch and little by slowly has its arms around me in a bear hug and I ease God out and now I don't really need to meditate. I'm busy. And nightly review, I work all day, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I don't even know what nightly review is. And my sponsor, I call him when I'm in a jam. And step 10, my walking around stuff, I'm doing a lot of damage and I'm making amends when it's convenient for me to make amends instead of promptly. And I'm worried about this reputation I have because I don't want to lose the reputation I created for AA or my, or my home group or my job or my relationship. And I haven't completed all my amends. I have some amends that are outstanding. Defects of character start to flex their muscles again. I'm not accountable to anyone. I didn't even have a sponsor. And as far as turning it over, I'm running the show. I am now God. Although I claim God to you. I said, oh, I believe in God. But I'm God. I'm making all my decisions. I'm seeking counsel on nothing. I have some insane thoughts coming back. And now I start to sneak around on the relationship. And now I start to uh, do things to my, with my company that mm, if I get caught, I'm going to get in some trouble. And it goes on and on and on. My life is a complete mess. I come to a meeting. I put on my AA game face. My life is completely unmanageable. I'm getting some weird thoughts going on. I'm acting out a little bit. I'm getting thirsty. And then bang, I get drunk. And I just went backwards through the steps. And I'm not immune to that. No one's immune to that, regardless of how long we're sober. Because as soon as I cut God out, I'm on my own. I'm on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Good luck. And tomorrow's not going to get better. Tomorrow's going to get worse until I need a drink. And then I use my mind, my broken mind, to figure this all out. I'll figure it out. Anytime I say, I'm going to figure it out, I think I know what I need to do, that is dishonesty in neon lights. I don't know what to do. I cannot figure it out. If I could have figured it out, 1988, when it came to AA, I would just put the plug in the jug, figure it out my life, and get on with it. But I can't. I came here because I can't figure this out. I can't figure out sobriety. I can't figure out God. I can't figure out anything. So I come to AA in desperation. Tell me what to do. You tell me what to do. Six months goes by. I know what I need to do. Just think of the arrogance. I did it. Until we bottom out. And bottoming out can be a great thing for many of us. There's some guys I've sponsored over here. I pray for them to bottom out. And people who are drinking, I pray that they bottom out. I stop praying for sobriety for them. I'm not God. I pray that they bottom out because when we bottom out, we become teachable. December 22nd, 1988, I completely bottomed out in AA. I was off the chain as we would say. 
I was driven by a hundred forms of fear. I was selfish, self-seeking, self-serving. I was acting out. I couldn't sleep at night. I wasn't eating. I was a train wreck. And going to AA meetings, and I got really thirsty on December 22nd, 1988. But that wasn't the plan. It just showed up. The alcohol piece of us, the alcoholism, would just show up. And we're thirsty, really thirsty. And usually when suddenly shows up, we have, I have no shot. When that thing comes knocking, it pulls me by the throat, off I go. And if I'm lucky, I get back. So the way we go forward through steps, I can go backwards through the steps. And my God has made that abundantly clear to me at a deep level. What I'm very grateful for is I don't have to go, I don't waver on that. This is how God has made me. He's disciplined me to the spiritual life. So the drinking thoughts and the acting out thoughts and that kind of behavior has been removed. And that's a day at a time process contingent on my spiritual condition. Our book uses the word maintenance, and that word has gotten like destroyed in some of our meetings. Maintenance doesn't mean to just keep as is. A flowing river is a healthy one, one that just gets stagnant. You can't drink the water. It gets ugly. We need to be flowing, growing, or we're going, as the old timers would say. So I come to step 10, and it talks about growing on this thing. In fact, step 10 has a page and a half of incredible spiritual information. A page and a half is all it is. And there isn't much to do in step 10. I get to do step 10, which is my walking around. What I'm doing after my prayer meditation in the morning, which is really piece of 11, now I'm off. I'm in the car and I'm going to work and I'm at work. I'm coming to a meeting. I'm going shopping. I'm taking care of my children. Whatever it is in my day, whatever my chores are. And very often the mind says, in order to be spiritual, I have to own all day long. And I have to look for signs. I have to have these things happen to me. And I could be just waiting for Godot. I could be waiting forever. And sometimes the most spiritual thing can happen is my children are hungry, I feed them. My children need a hug, so I hug them. Whoever I'm in a relationship with is having a bad day, so I console them. And I don't tell them, well, we should be doing this. I don't need to reprimand. Sometimes I need to reprimand. It's simple things. Taking my dog for a walk and walking up and down the block and just being grateful to do that is very spiritual. Sometimes we're waiting for this thing or Moses to, you know, this voice of Moses come down from the heaven and say, you are touched. Sometimes it's that little nudge, that little quiet voice that says, do this, don't do that. It's a very commanding voice, very powerful voice. There's a great story, and uh, I'm probably going to ruin it, but the master is with the students, and he's pointing to the stars. He says, look, the wonder of God, he points to the stars, and all the students see his master's fingers. He misses the whole thing. And we can do that in recovery. We're looking for this thing, and it's right in front of me in my home group when I'm making coffee for my home group, or cleaning the coffee pot out, or setting up the meeting, or working with the new one at my kitchen table. It's all part of God's work. And when I look for it like that, when I'm in that, those great things will show up. Very interesting how we can do. We, I become a landlord of my own kingdom, and I, I make the rules and regulations on what my spiritual life should look like, rather than just being with other drunks. Going to family's houses not being an embarrassment anymore. Packing into the mainstream is what our book talks about. There's some inter in, pretty interesting instructions here. It says this thought brings us to step 10. What thought are they talking about here? As I cleaned up the wreckage of my past. So if I'm actively making amends... And I'm cleaning up that list. It's kind of a sliding into step 10, assuming we're still making amends. But if I have 50 amends to make and I knock out 20 and I kick back, expect to do 10, 11, or 12, it ain't going to happen. I can't enter the world of the spirit with a cognitive mind. I can't do it in an awakened spirit. It's spirit to spirit here in step 10. Isn't it interesting on how many meetings we don't talk at length about prayer meditation or step 10, what it's like to enter the world of the spirit? Use that for a topic. Tonight's topic, what it's like experientially entering the world of the Spirit. You know why? Because how many of us are not doing it? We should have a room of 50, everyone talking about, here's my experience entering the world of the Spirit. I clean up amends. This is what my meditations feel like and look like. But it's this thing in the back. It's in September. Don't worry about it. It's in September. You don't need to do that. They just put it in the book to make it look good. Right? Uh, there was a, a, an old time is just to say, if you want to hide anything from an alcoholic, put it in the big book. 
It says this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory, continue to set new, uh, write any new mistakes as we go along. We're looking at 4 through 9 here. Continue to take personal inventory, which means I must have taken inventory somewhere. That was in step 4. And set right any new mistakes, step 9. Which means I'm going to be seeking counsel with someone, step 5. And what do I see in inventory? My defects of character, which move me into my behavior, column 4, 6 and 7. Throughout the day, 429, 429, 429, 429. That's my walking around step. It says, I vigorously commenced this way of living as I cleaned up the past. Our book uses words like vigorously commenced at once, next, now, action. Nowhere does it say, listen, you did good, hang out. Work on your 90 and 90, you need it. It's always moving. You see a duck on a pond, they're just kind of just moving along gracefully. They're beautiful. Take a look under the water. They're paddling. They're working. This is what we do. We're working. It says, I've entered the world of the spirit. My next function is I don't hang out. I have a function, and that's to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And we always taught, take a statement and flip it into a question. What am I doing currently to grow in understanding and effectiveness? Besides my big book and going to AA. Am I doing anything else? If I'm not, and I'm okay, fine. But am I working with other inspirational books along with my big book or not? That's what I've been doing since the get-go in AA. All my teachers were uh, 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 guys who studied other books, from scripture to sp other spiritual books. And not just to read them, but to have an experience with that book. So the book becomes who I be. It says, be quick to see where religious people are right, make use of what they offer. So I don't believe in God. How did I find out drugs work? I, I tried it. How did I find out liquor makes me feel good? I tried it. But we'll approach this power called God who's keeping me sober with contempt prior investigation. I'm not going to go near it. But how do you know until you try? It says this is not an overnight matter. It should continue for my lifetime. Here's what I need to do during the day. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Watch. One of the words, the four words we've worked with in my lineage forever is watch, turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn in to this power in order to go out. If I don't turn in, I will go without. But here's the hook. If I turn in too long, you better look out. And what I mean by that one is we can turn to God and worship God and spend time with God, and then we start to really become self-absorbed. Honey, I can't help you with the children. I'm meditating now. The house is burning down, but I got 10 moments of meditation. And I can't do anything else because I need to do this. And really what I'm doing is worshiping me again. But I need to turn in order to go out. Watch aware and observe. Those words are interchangeable. How I'm doing. How's my speech? How's, how's my walk? How am I doing? Constant vigilance. It says, when the, uh, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these things crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. I discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly, immediately, quickly. Discuss them with someone immediately, make amends quickly. Immediately, quickly. When we want to get high, we do it immediately and quickly. Not 90 days. Then I turn my thoughts to someone I can help, and love and tolerance of others is our code. Now watch this. This is where AA will split, depending on where we are. It says we cease fighting anything or anyone, dash, even alcohol. Like alcohol is an afterthought, but by this time, I'm not running away from booze. I'm not running to booze. It's there. I'm here, so be it. I cease fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. So the question is, who am I fighting with in my head? Who am I wrestling with constantly? Me and my mind, me and other people, my into the future regrets about the past. I sit on a couch and I'm restless, irritable, and discontented, and no one's around. Kind of like when you're driving over to this meeting all alone and you think you're alone in the car, but if you replay the walk, the drive over here, you're in uh, contact with about 45 other people in your car. No one's in the car. But you're arguing, you're talking, you're figuring stuff out. You're, you know, all this stuff going on. When you get back in the car, they're all waiting for you. It constantly goes on and on and on. And usually it's not too good. Or you're going to be a CEO of the great, you're going to take over like Facebook. You're going to be the new CEO of Facebook. You'll be worth billions. And everyone's going to bow down to me. I'm going to have all these things, right? And then you look at your bank account and say, oh, my God, I'm a long way off from that. We go from euphoria to depression. 
all because the mind's in charge, and I'm talking to all these people. Cease fighting anything or anyone. I remember um, I was watching uh, a knit game, and I was home, I was sitting on the couch, and I realized I had watched an entire four quarter plus halftime of a knit game, basketball game. I had watched the whole four quarters plus halftime of a Nick game by myself, the whole game by myself, by myself. No phone call. You know, we all cigarette, phone, radio, TV, all at once, right in inventory in the middle of that. <laughs> all by myself, no phone, the game, a little something to eat, no one around. And when the game ended, I was going about my business. Oh my God, I just watched the entire game and there was no stuff going on in my head. No fighting, no wrestling, no drinking, no nothing. How, how did that happen? The spiritual life makes absolutely no sense based on, based on my track record. It makes no sense. I have to always be doing something, always be busy, always get into some drama, always just something going on. I can't just be alone in perfect peace and ease. I can't go sit on the beach with no phone. Oh, I can't do that. I need a phone. I'm, I'm scrolling for hours, you know, contacting, texting. Got to call Joe, see how Joe's doing. Why? Because I can't just sit here and watch Waze for an hour all by myself. You know why? Because the mind is so busy, it needs to do something. That's just something, and I have found there's something wrong with my spiritual condition. I'm not alone in perfect peace and ease. I'm fighting, I'm wrestling, I'm, I'm delusions of grandeur, i got stuff going on. My mind is still my master. Even though I mask it when I come into a meeting, so I'm good, I'm good. I'm, 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 I'm perfect peace and ease. I share a lot of means, I'm great. No, I'm not. State of obsessions about a lot of things. Step 10 tells me it's not going to be that way. In fact, if the thoughts come, I don't have to hook into them anymore. Here they come, there they go. Here they come, there they go. It's kind of watching like romper room going on in my head. I flip the channel. Love and talents of others is our code. It doesn't mean I let I roll over when things happen. If someone's doing something unacceptable, I have every right to say that's unacceptable. You can't talk to me that way. This behavior is unacceptable, but I don't walk around gossiping about you or criticizing you or critiquing you or, or throwing you under a bus. I just confront you on something that's unacceptable, and then we move on. You and I can agree to disagree right now and really go at it. And when it's done, okay, let's move on. We'll go for coffee. You have one view, I have another. That's it. Love and talents of others is our code. In the big book, it says, remember that we're talking about a new person. They are very ill. So new people will come in and sometimes disrupt the meeting. They only know what they know. So I would tell them, no texting. This is unacceptable here. You can't smoke here. I don't have to walk around and tell everyone that guy's an idiot. Because now I'm guilty of what I accused you of, being an idiot. And the other thing I found, if I'm sponsoring myself, my sponsor is not too healthy. And speaking up, now I speak from out, dude, I do this a lot. This is one little piece of my journey in recovery. And I said this from a million podiums, if God removed me from a podium and says no more speaking, I'll sit in the back and I'll be okay. But this should not be what I do for recovery. This is one piece of it. What I do is when I'm away from the podium, my worship with God, my cleaning up amends, I try to make my house into a home, make a loving home, a safe home, you know. A place you want to be in. And hopefully treat my workers and the people who work with me and for me as men with respect. It all comes from this powerful God. It's all about living in step 10. How am I doing? My spots of Mark would always say, how am I doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? It says, for by this time sanity will have returned. I will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, I recoil from it as from a hot flame. I react sanely and normally, and I find that this has happened automatically so much for having to think the dream through. My book just told me this same rational thinking happens automatically based on my spiritual condition. I don't have to play the tape to the end, remember where I come from, keep it green. That's all my broken mind trying to figure out how to fix itself. It's not going to take me to the right place. At some point, it'll say, you know what, a double looks good right now, why not? You, you, you can drink safely. You should seek vengeance on that person. You should gossip. After all, this is justified gossip. Look what they did to me. In another book, it says, and I'll paraphrase, if they come into your house and steal, give them everything and then turn the other cheek. Don't seek vengeance. Don't take them to court. 
What an order. Yet how many times in AA I claim to be spiritual, but if you double-cross me, you gossip about me, I'm out for you. I'll gossip more about you because you gossip once about me. It's justified. No, it's not. Not in the spiritual world. It's about all forgiveness and all love and no opposite. What an order. Here's the narrow road. But at the end of the day, guess who's sleeping at night? Guess who's free and able to wear, wear the world like a loose garment? It says, we, I will see that my new attitude towards liquor has been given us, given to me without any thought or effort on my part. No thought equals total peace equals freedom. No thought, no thinking equals total peace equals freedom. When I'm not thinking, I'm great. When I don't have my own thoughts going around, I am free. And I'm, I'm moved by that intuitiveness or dependence upon God. And my book says, God gave me a brain to use to figure stuff out. As long as I'm thinking, I'm probably self-seeking. As long as I have thoughts going on, there's probably some fear in there. If I have thoughts and thinking going on, there's probably some ego in there. I'm not so open to criticism, constructive criticism. And I'm seeking vengeance on people who want vengeance on me. That's all my thinking. It's all my ego. It's all this wonderful predator called a thinking mind, which has no, there's no room for the mind in 10 and 11. You don't need it. One of my teachers would say, you don't need a mind. Not now. Planning a vacation? Okay, now we have proper use of the will. How much money? Where am I going? Do I have to pack enough stuff? Etc. Proper use of the will. Other than that, I really don't need to think. For example, if anything I'm saying so far is annoying you and making you uncomfortable, it's not me trying to make anyone uncomfortable. It's the mind and the thinking saying, why is he talking about this stuff? Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like this. I disagree with this. Who does he think he is anyway? Guess who's doing the talking? Ego. Guess who's doing the talking? The mind. Guess who's doing the talking? My illness. Oh, I can't learn from, I'm I'm a Catholic. I can't learn from a rabbi. He's he's not a Catholic. Guess who's doing the talking? And vice versa. Contempt five investigations. Step 10 clears me out of all of this. It tells me... uh, this is the miracle of it. I'm not fighting, nor am I avoiding temptation. I feel as though I've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I haven't even sworn the stuff off or the things that were haunting me for the longest time. Instead, the problem has been removed. It doesn't exist for me. I'm recovered. The thing that was at me, the symptom of this great problem, alcohol, and the other things that were under the surface that were at me all the time and determined everything I thought, felt, saw, did, are no longer there. I'm in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. The problem has been removed. I'm in a place called recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. <clears throat> Back in step 10, they talk about, uh, 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 came to believe that the power of myself could restore me to sanity. And here in step 10, they says, here's sanity. They give it to you on a silver platter as a result of four through nine. It's a guarantee. Spiritual transformation, my book, is guaranteed. There's no, well, you might get one. Let's see what happens. Let's hope for the best. Or someone told me today, hanging in there. Right? We don't have to hang in there. My sponsor called me up years ago, about, I don't know, five, six in the morning. He said, how you doing, money? He just called me money. How you doing, money? I said, Mark, I'm hanging in there. He read me the ride out for the next half hour about hang, hanging in there. You belong to AA, you're upright, sober, second air, and you have the glory of God in your life. You're hanging in there. What did we miss? But we will settle for, I'm hanging in there. Because I'm not rich yet, so I'm hanging in there. I don't have a new Rolls Royce, I'm hanging in there. I'm going through my home group, I don't like anybody, so I'm hanging in there. Right? Step 10 is about opening up the doors, the spiritual path. Now, that narrow road, here's my experience, very narrow road, very, very narrow gate to which I'm going to pass. Something happens that in the narrowing of this road, this world, this life gets huge. I'm not plagued by me anymore, my thinking. At times I am. But in that narrowing of the road, if I stay on that path, something opens up that's huge, it's vast, it's abundant. A lot of it is God. You can feel it. You either go down to the beach and you look at the sun. Uh, as the sun's coming up, it's God. Sun setting God. Look at the dog. Look at your children. Look at the wife. I mean, whatever it is. Look, it's God all over the place. I ate three times today. It's God. There's a time when I had a boost, a pack of Twinkies, every couple of days to eat. That was my diet. 
I think about where I was a bunch of years ago, and, and I, I'm not making this up. I, I, before I got thrown out of this little apartment that I wasn't paying rent in, and I brought all sorts of unsavory characters in there, I remember up in the uh, uh, cabinet where you would normally have food, I had what was left of a box of spaghetti. I don't know how long it was up there. And a box of domino sugar cubes. I don't even know how to got there. Probably when I moved in, my dad put all that stuff in, so I ate. And um, my diet consisted, this before I was homeless, I would take a handful of those, those spaghetti, break them in half, put them in a the pocket, a handful of sugar cubes, put them in the other pocket. And that's what I would eat during the day. Stale spaghetti and a handful of sugar cubes. That was the diet. Now, I had the same clothes on that I would crash out with the night before I just get up and walk out the door. There was no, like, you know, bathing and brushing your teeth and fixing your hair and putting on clean clothes. It was just an excess. There were laundry piled all over the floor, just a pile of laundry. And brandy bottles all over the floor and garbage that was overflow. I mean, just think about it, all over the floor. I mean, it's just so odd. I, I can't deal with this now because I'm waking up like this, and the first thing I gotta do, I gotta get a drink in me. I don't know if anybody des identifies with this, but you hold a bottle like this, and you bring it up to you, and it drinks, and it comes up, you puke it up, because it's poison. And then you try it one more time, and boom, it stays down, and then, oh, okay, then the hands are stopping, and I gotta keep drinking here. This isn't like one or two, and I go to work. Now to sneak out, sneak back in, because I was back on rent. My landlord was looking for me, so you find ways to climb into a very narrow window in the back, Figure out how to get in the door without making it squeak because we find you getting called the cops. You know, and this is how you live. And this is before it got worse. So I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they give me some spiritual disciplines to work with. And I like the effect produced by God. I like the effect produced by sobriety because I don't live like, I don't live anything like that anymore. It's almost this other guy who took me over. There's this possession that went on in my life. And the, the, the reality is I can be back there tonight. Because I'm the type of drunk, I pick up a drink, I'm in a dumpster tonight, suit and all. There's no gradual decline with this. Some of us have a gradual decline. Me, I blow up, I'm on a mission in five minutes. That guy scares me. I don't want no part of that. I hope he's dead for good and all. Because he was trying to do it. Well, we come into this place called the sunlight of the spirit. Everything changes. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But when God shows up, God shows up. I was driving home. I was uh, marketing for treatment center years ago. And I'm working with my sponsor. We just came through the work. And uh, I'm doing new 10 and 11 stuff. I'm working with some spiritual books along with my book. And um, <clears throat> I'm driving back from way out in PA back to Jersey. And I'm just driving back. There's a PA turnpike. And out of nowhere, God burst upon me. You know what I'm talking about? Just you get a shot of God. And I'm just driving in a van after a full day. Two-hour drive, two-hour drive back. And I'm exhausted. And I'm tired. And I'm hungry. And I'm driving. And boom. And suddenly, I got tears rolling down my eyes. I'm euphoric. Because I worked. I did a full day's work. I did a good day's work. I'm self-supporting. No one's after me. All my bills are paid. I'm going to home group tonight. What a great day. I'm going to go home and have a meal. I'm going to take a nice hot shower, put on clean clothes in a warm house. This is great. God. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. When God shows up, God shows up. You can be in the supermarket. You can be with your children. You can be doing anything. And suddenly there's this thing that you know God's walking with you. And there is no doubt in that moment. And very often when we're in the presence of this power, we weep. It's that powerful. And if you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Here come tears. And not sorrow tears. They're, they're euphoric. They're joyful. Standing in the presence of this great power. And no one is outside that circle. There's no one more special. There's no one who deserves more. Everyone is the same in, in his eyes. Just when the ground's fertile, he will deliver. And if I think about the worst moment in my life, personally, next to my mom dying, was June 23rd, 1988, when I woke up. I wasn't planning to stop drinking that day. which is another day of terror, another day of torment and hell. And something happened in that day, early in that day, where the curse to do battle was completely removed, and I went and called on God. And in that awful, terrible time, God burst upon us. Bill talks about it laying in, 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 in the hospital bed. He was not sponsorship material. He was at the bottom of the bottom. They thought we were going to be committed somewhere. Boom, here comes God. That's how God works. It's kind of like love and death. You don't expect it, and when it happens, it's life-changing. 
You can't plan it. But there it is. And that's how God works. And it keeps me right sides. Because I know if I do this, I'll have this Moses moment. So I'm doing it for the wrong reason. I do this not to die. I do this not to pick up a drink. I do this to experience God. And in his time, he will show up. And it's always, it's always that kind of power. It's always that kind of life-changing, mood-altering God. Hmm? In step 10. And what I get to do in step 11 is nurture that, get my soul food. Um, my sponsor would ask me a question. Uh, these questions always came between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning. He would call me. And he was usually just out of meditation, which I can tell. And after a while, I used to get a notepad and pen, and he would just go before we got to my stuff. And he would say to me, money, did you eat today? And he would say, why did you eat today if you ate yesterday? And I had no idea what he was talking about. And he pressed me and he pushed me. Well, if I don't eat today, I'll get hungry. Then what? I'll get sick. And then what? I'll die. Exactly. What are you doing for your soul food today? What kind of, how much God are you taking in today? What are you doing to carry the vision of God's will to our activities? You need to get your soul food every day. I can't rely on an old experience I had a year ago, five years ago to be sober today. That gets old quick. I get stale. I get stagnant. I get dusty. I get frail. I get sick. I get drunk. So what am I doing every day? Our book says every day we must carry the vision of God's will to all my activities. Step 10 says a kindly act once in a while isn't enough. I must act the good Samaritan every day. 24-hour clips. What am I doing for God? Not for me, for God. And really, as messenger of God, I'm not here to be served anymore. I've been served in abundance, but to serve. And there's something that comes to me. Whoever last shall be first. Sometimes I need a banquet to be grateful. I don't need a banquet. You need a lot of money to be grateful, feel spiritual. I don't, I don't have a lot of money. Everyone around me seems to be rich, but not me. <laughs> Surrounded by trust fund babies, I don't get it. I need a new car. I have a new car. I don't need it to be spiritual. I said, what a neat gift. What a, what a good deal. I drive around a new car. I used to drive around a moving violation. I mean, <laughs> no license, no tags, crack windshield. I had a, a car with a floorboard. You could see the concrete underneath as you're driving. It's like a Flintstones vehicle. And when the cops would pull you over, say, wow, what's the problem? <laughs> and meatballs are not masa balls, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to gossip about him after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> okay. How are we doing on time? Okay, it's a couple more things. It says it's easy to let up on my spiritual uh, uh, program of action and rest on my laurels. I had to look up the word laurels because I didn't know what that meant. I was not the brightest bulb in the box. Laurels, my accomplishments of yesterday, the good things I did an hour ago, the spiritual experience I had a year ago. I can't rest on that. It's constant vigilance, growing or I'm going. It tells me I'm headed for trouble if I do rest on my laurels. Go out goes a subtle foe. Again, I didn't know what subtle and foe meant. I looked up the di in the dictionary. Subtle, sly, clever, devious, difficult to detect. A foe is my personal enemy. It's pursuing me. And if I don't continue to seek God, it'll pull me right back. It doesn't care how long I'm sober. I've been faced with some thunderbolts over the years. Divorce, near bankruptcy twice. You get married, wedding bliss, and then suddenly go to a divorce, and they're taking everything you own, including your own breath. Everything. And you go to your bank account, there's no money now. I went to my bank account, there was no, no money. They took everything. My house was gone. Everything. And I was, uh, I was out of work, I was unemployed. What, well, okay, God, what do I do now? How am I doing then, spiritually? Who am I turning to? Is it God or another heart? I'm not cured of alcoholism, but I have as a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Every day is a day I must carry the vision of God's will to all my activities. How can I best serve God? His will, not mine, be done. It tells me these thoughts must go with me constantly. We can exercise our will power along this line to proper use of the will. There's a difference between proper use of the will and my will. 
proper use of the will is everything God has given me, throw it at this project, throw it at this person, throw it at this talk, throw it at my work. He's given me some gifts, given us all some gifts, go for it. That's proper use of the will. Trying to raise your children, you do the best you can. Have in a relationship with someone, you want to be the best you can for them and, and bring them love and things like that. You want to bring something to it. Proper use of the will. It's fueled with love. My will is self-seeking, self-serving. And the difference between my will and God's will, I know what God's I know what my what God's will isn't. I know what my will is. Usually God's will is free and easy. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. My will, stress, anxiety, fear, worried about the outcome, projection, ego, self-serving, self-seeking is a payoff to me. Got to figure it out. God's will, usually we just move right in front of us. Do you ever like say things to someone that you say, where did that come from? Boy, that was good. You work with someone and there's this thing that happens because you really want to help them. And you're throwing all your years of experience at this new person. And things start to pop. All of God, because I'm in there for the right reason. But if I'm in there for the wrong reason, I now have to figure stuff out. How am I going to do this? I'll do this so they don't do that. There's all of this. We become the director again. And that's fueled by fear. And that's not a sense of ease and comfort. That's restless, irritable, discontented. We have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to be in AA and be joyous, happy, and free as my big book tells me they want us to be. So if I'm experiencing freedom right now, how free do I want to get? Do I want to get freer? And if I'm sitting in a meeting or meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm experiencing bondage, why? I have an abundance of stuff, abundance of folks, an abundance of God. And we come to AA, like I did in my first six months, and I'm rolled up tighter than a baseball. I'm going off the handle any minute. They're talking about me. And we can be joyous, happy, and free. Step 10, my walking around what I'm doing making amends quickly, being accountable to someone, my inventory throughout the day. And when I get home at night, I sit down and review my day and put it all on paper. We're out of time. That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.